In the video today, we're answering a viewer question because Preston asks us, why are rabbit paws lucky? Raccoon penis bones, and yes, many non-human placental mammals actually have literal bones there. Vulture heads, lucky pennies. A vast and eclectic array of amulets, talismans, and charms meant to bring good fortune to their owners have been put to use as long as humans have walked the planet. To the ancient Egyptians, images of the scarab beetle helped ward off evil. The Romans favored winged phalluses. Go to Turkey and you'll find the evil eye goggling protectively at you from shop windows, front doors, dashboards, bracelets, you name it. Christians the world over wear crucifixes. Gamblers and athletes are notorious for placing their faith in almost any object or act they feel is imbued with propitious mojo. The desire for divine or mystical protection against the host of harms out there spans all cultures and all times. But why a rabbit's foot? Why not the leg of a frog or the spleen of a porcupine? In Europe, the tradition of carrying the foot of a rabbit is thought to stem from ancient totemic beliefs that humans descended from animals, and particular tribes had their origins in specific species. A tribe worshipped its animal ancestor and carried parts of that animal as protective totems. The Celts, by around 600 BC, are known to have associated rabbits with good fortune. The whole rabbit, not just the foot, though. According to Celtic folklore, the fact that rabbits lived in burrows deep underground meant that they were in direct communication with the gods and the spirits of the underworld. From here, it isn't clear whether this contributed to the very modern practice of the lucky rabbit's foot that popped up around the turn of the 20th century in America. These Celtic beliefs did evolve somewhat, carrying over into certain European cultures. For instance, in the 16th century, there is work by Reginald Scott that mentions that a good way to ease the pain of arthritis was to carry around a rabbit's foot. It is possible that this was then blended with aspects of African-American folk magic. Or it may be that the specific lucky rabbit's foot tradition simply came from traditions in the African folk magic that were unrelated to the European traditions associated with the rabbit. We just don't have the hard document evidence to be able to discern the exact lineage. But in either case, it is generally thought that African folk magic played a role in the modern tradition and possibly is the most direct ancestor to the superstition. In Hoodoo, which was an American mashup of African folk spirituality and certain European traditions, a rabbit's foot came to be a common item used for various things. Probably from this, around the late 19th century and early 20th centuries, rabbit's feet started being associated among the wider populace more exclusively with luck. Not just any foot would do, however. In an example of counterintuitive magic, what folklorist Bill Ellis terms reverse elements, the more inauspicious the circumstances surrounding surrounding the origins of the foot, the better. The left rear foot was favored, left being the evil side. And you note here that the word sinister derives from the Latin sinestra, meaning left. It was also once believed that left-handedness was the result of the devil and that lefties were predisposed to evil behaviors. Ellis quotes an early advertisement that takes these reverse elements to the level of the absurd, purporting that the owner was selling the left hind foot of a rabbit killed in a country churchyard at midnight during the dark of the moon on Friday the 13th of the month by a cross-eyed, left-handed, red-headed, bow-legged negro riding a white horse. All of these elements, of course, were considered ominous, if not downright evil, but they made the rabbit's foot even more potent as an agent of good. Another characteristic of the rabbit that probably made it such a widespread symbol of luck is its well-known and prodigious breeding habits. Indeed, there are references to rabbit's feet being carried around to aid in fertility before they were associated so strongly with luck. And before you start smugly thinking that the rabbit's foot is just yet another example of superstitious mumbo-jumbo given credence to by our silly ancestors, remember that even today, many buildings skip a 13th floor, or fourth in some East Asian cultures, and many airlines don't have a row 13 on their aircrafts, and if possible, a surprising amount of people avoid holding important meetings, events, or trips on Friday the 13th. We're more superstitious than we'd like to admit even today, and that, knock on wood, is unlikely to change anytime soon. Humans, well, we're rather weird. And now for some bonus facts. Speaking of superstition, abracadabra. These days, you might hear this word before some cartoon stage magician pulls a rabbit out of his hat, but hundreds of years ago, people actually believed that abracadabra was a magical spell or talisman. The exact origin of the word is up for debate, but perhaps one of the oldest records we have of abracadabra being used is a snippet from a Roman sage named Serenus Simonicus in the 2nd century AD from his Liber Medicillinianus. 
The malady the Greeks call hemitratios is more deadly. None of our ancestors could name this disease in our own language, nor did they feel the need to. On a piece of parchment, write the so-called abracadabra several times, repeating it on the line below. But take off the end so that gradually individual letters, which you will take away each time, are missing from the word. Continue until the last letter makes the apex of a cone. Remember to wind this with linen and hang it around the neck. Many people say that the lard of a lion is effective. It's unlikely that Simonicus came up with the word on his own, and it is thought to have been in use before then. There are a couple of theories as to where it might have ultimately come from. First, it could have been derived from the equally magical word Abraxas, whose letters in Greek numerology add up to 365, the number of days in the year. It could also be that early sages thought this was a powerful word and somehow created abracadabra out of it and turned it into a cure. Alternatively, the word might be derived from the Hebrew words for Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Ab, Ben, and Rao Hakodesh, respectively. Perhaps more intuitively, it could be derived from the Aramaic phrase Avracadavra. Harry Potter fans will likely know that this is what J.K. Rowling used when she was coming up with the killing curse Salvada Cadavra. In an interview, she stated that the original phrase meant, let the thing be destroyed, which would suit the cure theory well. Avracadavra was written to destroy the sickness. As strange as it may seem today, people really did wear talismans with the abracadabra cone, as Simonicus described in it. It was thought to cure diseases, fever, and other problems by siphoning it out of the person and expelling it through the bottom A. Obviously, it would have no more than a placebo effect on the user, but people seemed to put a lot of stock in it. For example, in the 1500s, Eva Remington Taylor wrote the troublesome voyage of Captain Edward Fenton, in which she claimed, Bannister saith, yet he healed 200 in one year of an egg by hanging abracadabra about their necks. Abracadabra was still used as a cure well into the 18th century, as evidenced by a 1722 book by Daniel Defoe titled Journey of Plague Year, which lamented the use of such charms. People deceived, and this was in wearing charms, filters, exorcisms, amulets, and I know not what preparations to fortify the body with them against the plague, as if the plague was but a kind of possession of an evil spirit, and that it was to be kept off with crossings, signs of the zodiac, papers tied up with so many knots, and certain words or figures written on them, as particularly the word abracadabra formed in a triangle or pyramid. How the poor people found the insufficiency of those things, and how many of them were afterwards carried away in the dead carts. Eventually, people let go of the abracadabra superstition, and by the 19th century, the practice of hanging an abracadabra charm around your neck to cure disease had died down. At this point, the word stretched to take on the meaning of fake magic, which is what we know it for today. Finally, going back to rabbits. If you're wondering why rabbits are considered such prolific breeders, it has less to do with them getting it on more than many other animals necessarily, and more to do with the time frames involved in the process of producing new rabbits. A baby rabbit becomes sexually mature in an average of just five to six months, and sometimes even sooner. They can potentially live up to around 10 years. Further, it takes only around a month from the point of getting pregnant for a female rabbit to give birth. Their litters can include as many as a dozen rabbits. What makes this even more astounding is that the female rabbit can get pregnant as soon as the next day after giving birth. Rabbits are induced ovulators, so the females are pretty much ready to get pregnant any time they mate, assuming they aren't already pregnant, with the mating triggering the ovulation. Needless to say, even just a single female can give birth to several dozen baby rabbits per year. Given this, combined with the fact that the babies are ready to make babies at the stage when most human offspring are still mostly just parasitic poop and drool factories, you can see how how rabbits got this reputation. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. If you're looking for more from me, why not check out another channel I do called Geographics. It's all about geography, linking to that below. And thank you for watching.